Welcome to EvolvedNest.org Explained. My name is Dr. Darsha Narvaz and I'm here with Mary Tarsha. Hi, Mary. Hi, Darsha. We are both at the University of Notre Dame's Department of Psychology and at the Kroc Institute for International Peace. Today, we are going to start uh, speaking about one of our components of the nest, and that is positive moving touch and no negative touch. That's component number three in our list of nest components. And let me just say a little introduction. We evolved to be nested as animals, as human beings, as social mammals. <clears throat> and our nest for young children helps optimize children's development, thriving, and resilience. And what do we mean by that? What does that look like? Well, it includes physical health, happiness and well-being, self-acceptance and self-confidence, self-control, emotional intelligence, social skills, empathy, perspective taking, kindness, and active curiosity. And it's not only children that are uh, helped by the nest, it's adults too. So when you have a good beginning, your adulthood goes better. And even if you didn't have a good beginning in childhood, you can at in the adult years, re-nest yourself. And what we also want to give you a sense of what a, a thriving adult looks like. <clears throat> and this is from research that's been done around the world. Oh, uh, an adult with well-being has a quiet mind, unbridled creativity, access to their unique geni genius. They have inner happiness, a childlike glee, vitality and abundance of electricity in the body. They are able to listen unconditionally to others. They have empathy and respect for others and for nature. They have authentic helpfulness towards others. They feel fully alive and they demonstrate love, compassion and forgiveness. That's what we're aiming for here and nestedness helps bring it about. So let's look at that nestedness. These are the nine components we have identified and we do research on. And we're talking today about positive moving touch. Mm -hmm. Yes, and all of those lists about well-being that you mentioned, they're so exciting. And so these podcasts that we're doing here on the Evolved Nest Explained are to help answer the question, how do we get there? How do we get to that particular goal that sounds so great? And so we're doing a, a deep dive into each component separately to explain, um, you know, the converging evidence from multiple fields about why each, each of these components has been identified as critical and why it's so important for a development across the lifespan. And that means the physical development, the neurobiological development, all your brain works, all your, all your systems are working together. And then how you are in the world with other people uh, and how you feel uh, strong in the world to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I mean, as we've talked about before at other times, not in podcasts, but you know, about helping to use your whole brain. So oftentimes we go through life developing just one part of our brain, just the left hemisphere, but the nest, the nest components are helping develop every aspect of your neurobiological development, including your whole brain, so you can feel fully alive. Yeah, so it's about optimizing your potential, not just minimizing get through life, you know, you didn't get thrown in jail or, you know, you graduated from high school and yeah, you're, you hold on a job. That's not optimization. It's finding that treasure self of you inside, your uniqueness, that only you, your gift is, uh, is there to be shared and how to get to that place where you're able to share freely without uh, shame, without guilt, without uh, anger. It's getting to that place to be open and free. So here's our outline. We're gonna have four topics. Uh, why is touch important in early life? The benefits of positive touch for all ages, how a lack of touch or even negative touch is harmful and then what to do now. This is a great place to start. So can you tell us, Darsha, a little bit about why, why we're starting here with a hominid comparison? 
So according to the biologists and ethologists, we are part of this family, this genus of hominids. And you can see on the left column there, that's the, those are our cousin animals. You know, people sometimes don't like to know their animals, but we are. And humans are at the bottom. And you can see across the top are the topics that are being uh, discussed in this chart. And the first is how long you're in the womb, gestation, brain volume then at full term birth. So for humans, that's 40 to 42 weeks. For eruption of first and last permanent teeth, which is indicative of cognitive and physical development, and the average length of breastfeeding in years. And then the a uh, general physical growth uh, when that is completed as uh, at two adult levels. Although the neuroscientists tell us the human brain isn't really adult level until around age 30, so it's a little, even longer. And look how much more immature we are at birth. Uh, we take longer in the womb, but we have to get out earlier than we're ready because the head gets too big otherwise for mom. Uh, to be able to carry and give birth safely. And then the teeth, you can see we're slower in developing. Uh, and then the average length of nursing is similar to our cousins, but look how much more it is than we think is normal. Four years average meaning age for, in our ancestral context and 99% of our history. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, age of 20 for physical growth. I mean, it's, you know, really amazing to see how immature humans are, you know, even just looking at that third column there, that at birth, only 25% of the brain is developed. There's so much growing that is going to take place, hopefully, right, outside of the womb and after birth. And this is why it's so important um, that we support that development. That's right. And touch is one of the key components to help the brain grow well. Why is that, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we see, as I was saying, that so much of development happens, neurobiological development happens after birth. And within the first year alone, the brain doubles 101 percent and we see by you know age three that 80 percent of the brain has then developed so we it's important to support neurological development but in particular in the early years because so much is taking place and the brain isn't developing its hemispheres at the same rate so in the first few years of life the right brain is developing more quickly and the right brain is responsible for many wonderful things, but uh, importantly, it's responsible for self-regulation and emotion regulation and also is involved in a lot, a lot of perception and being able to uh, take in information from the outside and also regulate the self, uh, both when, when the individual is alone or when the individual is with someone else. Anyway, all of this is taking place, setting the stage for right brain development within the first two years of life. And also the immune system is developing rapidly and very immature and doesn't really fully mature um, until about six years. And we see this is happening because of developmental plasticity with epigenetics, which is the turning on or off of genes as a result of what the infant is experiencing. And just to um, underscore the fact that we look like fetuses of other animals, mm -hmm. so we're 18 months of age. And so we babies are expecting the, the, uh, the same kind of experiences in the womb. In the womb, the baby's needs for nourishment or calming uh, just happen automatically through the placenta. And so babies have to adjust uh, outside the womb. They have to learn how to breathe differently. The diaphragm has to move in the opposite direction of when it's in the womb. And they need help with that. And they need this, what uh, uh, Ashley Montague called the external womb, exterogestation is the fancy word. And so we have to remember that babies really, really need the caregiver to be there to help shape them and reassure them that they can actually make it work in the world. Yes, and you know, you bring up a really good point because the caregiver is there shaping this neurobiological construction and the infant cannot on his or her own 
you know, regulate himself, regulate herself is really dependent upon the caregiver, right? Because that right brain isn't developed yet. And so uh, when infants are crying or they feel distress or they're expressing uh, some type of or pain or being upset, they very much need to be comforted. They need infants. They're not trying to manipulate. <laughs> they're, they're not trying uh, to confuse adults, but they're crying out and asking to be comforted and soothed. And it's important to remember that crying is a late signal. Hmm. Parents need to move in before crying starts. Sometimes baby can't, babies don't know how to stop crying sometimes uh, for months. So you don't want them to start if they just go, oh, got to pay attention. Or if they're, you know, starting to look uncomfortable and wiggling and they need to wiggle to get the diaphragm working in the right way. But, you know, if they start making faces, you know, then pick them up, rock them, keep them calm. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's so important for all those systems to have a calm foundation, not an erratic and, and stressed re, uh, foundation, because that shapes a different kind of personality, not a pleasant one. Yeah, and touch is a, is a huge part of that, huge part of soothing. Right. So we need that external womb. And also remember that babies are not like born like a car. And they are. <laughs> That's a good. <laughs> well, they're they're uh, shaped by experience, and every minute that baby's a different baby, because so many neurons are growing so quickly. I mean, you can't see it, of course. That's what's the mystery, and that's why we have to emphasize this, because it seems like babies just going to grow on their own, right? Like a you plant a tree and you leave them alone. No. Babies are not that way. They're shaped by the way you treat them. So nature and nurture are completely intertwined. There's no way to separate who that baby is from what they're experiencing. And mm -hmm. so uh, parents and caregivers are biosocially constructing that child. They're shaping the biology of the child, and then that biology is going to affect how socially uh, skilled and fitted they are in their culture or in their family. Mm -hmm. And can you say something too about with this bioconstruction then, it's also the emotions and the cognitions, right? And their um, implicit worldview. Um, that's really important, I think, as well. Yeah. So it all builds up into the kind of person they're going to be in the community, uh, what kind of morality they're going to have. Is it going to be about being open and flexible and tuned to others? Or is it going to be protectionist and bracing and, ah, you know, all about them because they don't feel safe, because they're dysregulated? That's what uh, dysregulation, for example, the stress response does. It makes you feel about uh, focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. that's what we don't want, right? If we're a good community member, a good citizen of the society, we need to have, you know, everything regulated well. Mm -hmm. And when, so this co-construction that's happening, and I think this is really important how we talk about that by providing these comforting experiences, you're giving them a really deep sense of safety and communicating messages of their value, of their own worth, of their own respect, and also the goodness of the world around them. And so, like you're saying, they grow up with this open-hearted disposition and worldview rather than, you know, depriving infants of and children of the care that they need and the comfort that they need can lead to um, setting those systems so they become off. And so the, the messages are communicated in the opposite way, right? Of a distrusting, there's a dissociate, dissociative practice going on. So a distrust of their own cognitions, a distrust of their own emotions, and then also a bracing orientation towards the world. That's right. So caregivers are co-constructing that, that child's body, their brain, their psyche, and their birth brain is being shaped to see how well it's going to work to help, help them breathe and, and coordinate, and then all sorts of to be developed brain uh, connections to the neocortex from the older parts of the brain, and then the prefrontal cortex, which is all about executive function and empathy and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are great images here, too. You can see how, you know, these caregivers are helping to provide this co-construction by the skin-to-skin -skin contact, by that close, affectionate contact here. Yeah, so for babies, it's really, really important to be 
holding them securely with, um, you know, and keeping them with you and in, in the, wherever you are in life, you know, walking around, have them skin to skin for women, they often have them tied on their back and, and they're learning, their body is learning how to be a human being, you know, and their, their brain and their social skills are all developing simultaneously. And that provides, you know, this is an age old, I mean, I'm not even sure, over a hundred years old, right? Talking about that inverted U shape of stimulation. There's this middle ground of this healthy stimulation. And so that it, it helps optimize development. And when you have the infant on you, you know, they're smelling, they're seeing, they're feeling. And so it's this optimal place of getting the type of stimulation they need to grow well. It's not too much stimulation and it's not understimulated either, such as being left alone by themselves in a crib, right? This is a very different experience. So you have to learn how to recognize the signals that the baby's had enough or is tired and you leave them to rest, right? And But you keep them in a, a contented state. Mm -hmm. So mammals really need touch to grow. They stop growing. <laughs> what <are> they <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> My goodness, and babies are growing so fast, right? There's thousands of synapses a second, and then you leave them alone, and they're like, oh, right? So uh, it's just not a good idea to leave babies alone. They expect, well, if we put it that way, um, figuratively, they expect 24-7 touch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and movement as well, right? Right, and there used to be cradles and, and rocking chairs that were very common until uh, Emmett Holt, I think, was the first uh, guy writing a popular parenting book back in the 1800s that got a lot of uh, attention and then spread into the 20th century. And we still have it with us, you know, that if you pick the baby up, you know, or rock them to sleep or whatever, uh, they get they'll expect it all the time. Oh my mm. God, you know, you'll spoil them. Which means, you know, if you adult don't really want to be with the baby, then you know, uh, lower the baby's expectations that you're not going to be there. And then, of course, you're kind of shifting all the trajectory of that personality. And there's mm. regulation when you do that. When you leave babies alone and you're teaching them that they really don't count and that they have to find some way to survive. Mm. Um, they have to learn to breathe from you. They have to learn how to, their heart rate from the listening to a, a, the adult's heart. Sometimes they need that movement. They need to be in contact with you in order to learn how to be in their body. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mean, you bring up a really good point about all this nest component about touch, but also all of the nest components as we talked about, are helping development. And so there is this myth that if I provide this one particular nest component, such as touch, they're going to be so dependent upon me. And, you know, they're going to grow up and be 30 years old and be right next to me you know, or something like this. They'll never be independent and uh, grow up and get a job or, or something. And, you know, it's actually the opposite, right? That when we provide these nest components that you're giving them everything they need in order to develop well and to become that strong individual uh, versus depriving them of these things, then you're setting in a type of dependence. That's right. So they are intended to be dependent in those first years on purpose. Uh, yes. and that, that's when they really, really need you as a caregiver. Uh, and then later that they don't need you anymore. They will be if you provide what they need, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So movement, uh, we know, helps digestion too. So uh, rocking helps the the digestion track uh, digests food and promotes brain development. So moving is really important. So get that rocking chair, right? <laughs> well, I'm gonna go. So positive touch effects hmm. include optimizing brain structures and wiring. So that means the stress response systems uh, and it builds secure attachment. They learn to rely on the caregiver for being consistently there and present, someone familiar. And then that leads to better social and cognitive functioning as an adult, as a child and as an adult. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like this about, you know, touch and the secure attachment. And so it's building, you know, this internal working model that um, the caregiver is here when I need them. You know, mom or dad is here or grandma, or grandpa is here when I call out to them. And so as they grow and develop, if there is a stress, they understand and they expect and they have this belief in the caregiver is going to come. And so this builds a type of self-regulation within themselves, right? So as they get older, even if there's a little delay within the comfort or the care, you know, their stress response systems aren't, um, you know, through the roof. They understand that the caregiver will come. And this is is all part of a positive touch. Right. And this uh, belief or understanding is really a very deep, implicit understanding. It's not explicit. You know, it's not in their head thinking, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm gonna show up any day uh, uh, later. Um, no, it's the body's kind of pattern recognition that when mm-hmm. I'm in this state, it's only brief. I'll be, it'll, it won't last very long. Um, so there's a certain expectations of all these systems that, yeah, I'll be comforted soon or um later on i can just think about my mom and feel comforted and so on mm-hmm. yep it's it beats in, unconscious right yeah. the implicit the unconscious but also embodied i think mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times when people talk about attachment they don't don't say how embodied it is it's how you know your stress response knows in a way knows i mean we, it's hard to talk about uh knows that it doesn't have to get all whacked out to get help Mm-hmm. If you had a consistent caregiver. Now, if you haven't had a consistent caregiver, someone who leaves you alone to cry, then you do have to scream to high heaven to get help, right? And so you learn that. So you quickly go into screaming if you've had a, someone who's left you to scream because that's the only, or you go into complete silence just to stay alive. Um, associate because that's what you've been taught, right? And so your body does that automatically when you're an adult and you get kind of stressed out. You'll go into the patterns that were set in early life and you don't know why you suddenly, you know, have a panic attack or uh, suddenly <clears throat> can't talk or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, panic or withdrawal. I mean, yeah. like having healthy, healthy uh, sense of attachment and uh, being able to regulate yourself sounds a lot better than that. <laughs> That's right. In one uh, study that was done, um, experiments, they had four groups. They had babies uh, right after birth who were placed immediately on their mother's um, uh, chest, skin to skin. Uh, They had other babies that were swaddled and put in mother's arms or swaddled and put near the mother in the same room or swaddled and taken down the hall. And the ones who were put on the mother's uh, chest, skin to skin, a year later were more self-regulated. They had a more attuned relationship with their mother, so better bonding and better uh, kind of um, relational connection and then the uh, and then those who had were at least in the mom's arms did better than the other groups so mm-hmm. even more but the best would be skin to skin you know I really like this makes me think of you know several neuroscientists and epigeneticists that we cite often such as Francis Champagne and Michael Meany and Alan Shore who use that term the biological embedding of the social environment and I think this is a great example of how important the environment is in shaping, especially positive touch and shaping these neurobiological systems. And so it, in a sense, it really is showing how the environment becomes embedded within our, within our bodies, within our nervous system. That's right. It's like your parents or your caregivers are sculpting your self, your body, your brain, your mind, your psyche. Mm-hmm. So our second topic is the benefits of positive touch for all ages. Mm, yeah, many benefits. So no matter what age you are, having positive touch prevents excessive stress. It prevents hippocampal dysfunction. It even prevents depression. And it also promotes many things, including healthy sleep, and adaptive behavioral arousal. So as we talked about before, we were alluding to this and something happens in life and you're able to adapt and to adjust to it. 
without going one or the other extreme, either too excited and too stressed or withdrawing and shutting down. Um, it also promotes exploratory activities and social and cognitive fun functioning, which is huge. I mean, we could say so much about those two right there and also just calming in general. So when babies are, have uh, adequate and nested touch in early life, they're gonna have these uh, outcomes. But uh, adults too, if you haven't had a lot of touch, and we'll mention that again later, you can help yourself with uh, learning to love to be cuddled, for example, or hugged or held or those kinds of things will also then help you with some of these promotional aspects, the healthy sleep and such, calming. All right, then we have the vagus nerve. This is one example of one thing in the body that is shaped by touch and responsive care in early life. And it's the cranial nerve 10 linking to major body systems. So if you do have trouble, if it's not set properly, you can have trouble in these systems with the uh, heart issues, breathing issues, immune system issues, emotional systems, or digestive issues like irritable bowel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the vag vagus means it's Latin for wandering, and they call it that because it literally wanders throughout your whole body, you know, innervating all of your visceral organs. And so when this nerve is develops properly and is set right, then all of these other bi biological systems work as they should. And when it's not set right, then you can have problems and difficulties in all of these major, major systems. And so we know that a good vagal tone or a well-functioning vagus nerve has physiological effects that are in early life um, and then that extend into later in life, include those um, major organs, visceral organs. And then we know that uh, it has an effect on epigenetics, turning on genes, controlling anxiety for life, for example, mm. and a stress response uh, to not be under or overreactive. So, so the tuning up of the vagus nerve happens in early life. Uh, you keep saying this, right? But uh, it also affects your later capacity for intimacy and compassionate response. So you do want a good vagus nerve for your ability to be social with others in intimate ways, but also in ways that are uh, open-hearted and kind. Mm -hmm. Yep, and Stephen Porges has done a lot of work in this area showing how the vagus nerve is part of the social engagement system. And so it's the, that's the neurobiological system that is activated whenever we are experiencing social pleasure with others. And so when the vagus nerve is tuned up well in life, you know, you have these capacities, you're able to engage and really enjoy healthy social interaction. Right. So as we keep saying, all animals evolved to have a nest or a developmental system and ours too. We have the nine components that's just one set, there's many more probably, but those are the ones we study. And so a species devel typical developmental system like the evolved nest is gonna then lead to a smart, effective creature with a species typical outcome. And so we can see then that lots of touching is the species typical way of raising children in our past and present. But what happens when the system or nest is degraded what happens when you don't provide that species typical developmental system, but an atypical one? Well, you shouldn't be surprised that the <laughs> is atypical, that you're going to not be as intelligent or effective as, as an individual. Mm -hmm. and so what do we have? This is more typical now for children to spend most of their time alone, untouched, uh, put in carriers, put in uh, cribs, I guess bassinets rather than cradles. Uh, at least they move in a cradle, right? Um, and so we expect kids to be okay with being alone physically. Hmm. 
And we could, uh, we could say more about, you know, Harry Harlow's studies in the mid 20th century where he accidentally started to study mo uh, monkeys that were separated from their mothers in a separate cage. Didn't realize that that was atypical until John Bowlby came along and said, hmm, that's not normal. <laughs> and so he made systematic experiments on kids who were separated, uh, monkeys, sorry, monkeys that were separated from their mothers and found that they were, you know, all sorts of dysregulation from that. And they, they had autistic-like behaviors. They would beat themselves on the on the cage. They couldn't get along if some peer was introduced into the cage. And even as adults, they were poor parents, they were aggressive and so on. So he demonstrated with animal studies and then there are other animal studies that have been done showing how important touch is <laughs> for proper development of a social mammal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this good to remind um, our audience that that was 1958, right, Darsha, with Harlow? Uh, one of his publications, yeah. One of, yes, so there's a lot of research, there's decades of, of research here <laughs> on the importance of positive touch. That's right. So why is it harmful? What's that look like? This is an image of a brain a uh, depressed brain on the right, a normal brain on the left. So you can see the neuron in the middle, that fat kind of body there with lots of connections, a lot of uh, uh, linkages to other neurons, other brain cells. And then on the right, there's far fewer connections. And that's what happens when you don't uh, raise, um, provide the nest, really. There's going to be some deficit somewhere. Remember that baby is a different baby every few minutes. And so what is it that's supposed to be growing on their maturational schedule that's built in, that's innate, that if you leave them to cry, what's not gonna be developing? What, if you're not holding them and touching them and rocking them, what's not happening? It's gonna look more like the right side. Mm -hmm. So here we have the uh, structure and function of physiology, just a few more things that we've, mentioned a few of them, how many of the systems of the body are established in early life, and many are affected by touch. Mm -hmm. Right. So these systems, at the root of this is the HPA axis, and this is your stress response system. And I think we go more into this later, but we can see that the takeaway is that when you provide the touch that is needed in early life, all of these systems are set well. The stress response system, the immune system, the endocrine system, neurotransmitters, emotions and emotional systems, the corpus callosum, which connects both hemispheres and brain hemispheric integration. And when there is a deprivation of care and deprivation of touch, what we see is that there are gaps and even lesions within the brain systems. And you can see the difference here, two different children, both the same age and one on the left, this is normal development. And on the right hand side, this is the result of extreme neglect. And so you can visually just with your own eyes, see how much smaller uh, the, the brain is, but then also notice not just the volume, but you can see that the connections are different and there are the darker parts or the gaps there. So it's not as well connected either. And these are brain scan uh, slices of children, three-year-olds, yeah. Mm -hmm. So lots of malformation then that uh, touches part of the nest that helps prevent malformation. We know that when the baby is physically separated from mother, we know from animal and uh, human studies that pain responses are going to increase in part because opioids, the internal kind of opioids you have in your body, endogenous opioids and uh, oxytocin decrease, the cuddle hormone, oxytocin. And if this happens during sensitive periods, during the time when that child is supposed to be turning genes on or off for certain things, uh, it will have effects long-term. Those genes will not get turned on properly and for the rest of life, for example, in animal studies, the child will be anxious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because I think, um, you know, it's a really profound 
insight that we now have the, the mechanisms of action by which deprivation and lack of touch influence and cause anxiety. And so those connections are, are strong and, you know, scientists are very careful, right, to, to elicit causation there. But um, there are a lot of models and a lot of um, animal, animal studies that are showing this really strong connection. So there's going to be, if you don't touch the offspring enough, there's going to be lifelong changes in stress responsivity. And these deficits that grow, those gaps in the brain can cause impulsive, violent, and antisocial behavior. The um, Martin Teicher has noted that the corpus callosum, the um, part of the brain that connects the left and right hemisphere, is thinner in those neglected brains, neglected, especially boy brains. And so you can flip into states and then not remember what your state was before. So you can fly off into a rage and then Later, someone will complain about it and say, what? What did I do? I don't remember any of that, right? So you can have these strange kind of personalities and you can get depressed. So here's the harmful kinds of touch, corporal punishment, which includes spanking, pinching, and slapping. And Mary, you want to talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have, you know, five decades of research on this and I, there's a lot of cultural myths out there about the lack of harm of spanking or pinching or slapping, but you know the evidence is really clear that this carries long-term negative consequences for children. And a recent empirical um, meta-analysis uh, doing so, what that means is doing a review of many, many, many studies found that spanking is empirically similar to physical and emotional abuse, and so. The effects here is we're seeing both cross-cultural and studies and longitudinal investigations and these large meta-analyses. We see all this evidence that, you know, um, all the spanking, pitching, slapping, and even harsher forms of physical punishment are really detrimental for children, decreasing their cognitive abilities, decreasing their self-esteem. It's also significantly associated with an increase in aggression, antisocial behavior, more external and internalizing problems, mental health problems, and an increase in a negative relationship with parents. So both the short-term and the long-term effects of corporal punishment um, are, are, are very severe, I think. Right, so if you're a parent that uh, is oriented to punishment because you were punished, it's time to get some help on that. Uh, it's uh, likely that your uh, stress response is also a little off kilter and you have to immediately do something to feel better, uh, to get back to your own balance and, and smacking somebody maybe is one way to do that. That's called externalizing. So um, we encourage parents to go to um, self reg uh, if this is an issue for you or if you as a non-parent even have those issues, uh, find out why and learn other techniques. Yes, and I mean, it doesn't work, right? I think that's the most important thing is that, you know, the spanking, pitching, or slapping, many times parents are trying to change a negative behavior within a child. And what happens is it becomes this negative cycle that rather than mitigating it, it often perpetuates it because it has all of these other negative. Uh, consequences. Right. So what to do now if you didn't get touch uh, or you're, you don't do touch in your household? Well, here's some everyday routine, routines to do with kids like, uh, you know, establishing hugs or whatever that feels comfortable and maybe moving closer over time. Maybe it's a high five first. Uh, Cuddle when you can, when reading or watching videos or something. Hold hands when you're talking or walking. Playing wrestle uh, games or chase. Uh, these are ways for especially young kids to uh, enjoy touch. And then dancing, you know, hold each other, play some fun thing and hold hands while you're dancing or something like that. So all sorts of little tiny things you can do.
All right, so then uh, remember then that holding infants, so hold them as much as you can, can leave traces on their genes. And uh, the amount of close and comforting contact from caregivers changes their molecular profile. Mm. It can be wow. more molecular level. Wow, it's a great quote that really summarizes everything that we've talked about. That's right. And so if you were an adult, you can do the similar kinds of things we listed for kids. You can get a cuddly pet, you know, dog, cat, rabbit maybe. Get massages, massage yourself, do some earthing. There's more and more research on the importance of being in physical contact with the earth, not in your synthetic shoes or synthetic clothes, but skin to skin on the earth. Walk barefoot, sit on the ground. Those things actually are very calming. Mm -hmm. Gardening, right? having contact with the earth. Yes, they lower cortisol and uh, help you relax. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank you very much for listening and for watching. And we are happy to give you more information. So contact us, find us at evolvenest.org. Uh, there's more at the Psychology Today blog and the website, my webpage, and there are emails. Thanks so much. Thank you.